architect Calatrava, whom I kind of dislike because the stage uh, is, is very lousy. It's, it, can, <laughs> it looks as a wonderful building, but you can't do much more like at La Scala Opera House uh, 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. You can push things from left and right and from back, and you can bring things down, and that's about it. But it's OK. I will live with it. The building is phenomenal. The music is extraordinary, and the conductor, one of the greatest alive. Can't get any better. When you direct but, uh, sorry, I wanted to say I, I was somehow disconnected from music because a music teacher, uh, when I was 13, forced me to sing in front of the whole mm. class, just wanting to break my back. And I disconnected myself from music like an artist. And then when school was over five years later, when I was 18, there was this enormous void and hunger for music. and. That's how I got, without any teaching and without anything, I immersed myself into music with a, a more, um, with a more ferocious uh, intensity than anyone else that I, I knew among my peers. Hmm. Um, the uh, the I, I, how did you deal with that moment um, when you were being forced to sing? Did you somehow? Well, everyone sang a song that was at that time that was this stupid uh, idea floating around that everybody had some music ta talent for music, <laughs> or talent for painting, which was kind of ridiculous. And and I stood up when 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 it came to me, I stood up and I said, I'm not going to sing. Mm -hmm. And then I became obstinate and I said to the teacher, you may do the somersault forwards and backwards, <laughs> but I'm not going to sing. So they called in the headmaster and now they stood they, they took the class hostage. These bastards took mm. the class hostage. I could strangle them today if I met them. And, and from that moment on, I, I, I seriously planned to burn the, the school building to the ground at night, which unfortunately I never did. So, but uh, to this moment, uh, and, and I said to myself, never in my life anyone is going to break my back. It will not happen again. That is unique, rather dead than having your back broken again. Hmm. So that was very helpful. It was very helpful that, that I immersed myself all on my own into music in a way that was kind of strange. And I, I deal well with music, and I love to stage operas once in a while to work and breathe and uh, form music and, and images. It's wonderful, and uh, I can't read music scores, and I have to tell the conductors, are you, uh, are you ready to take the insult that the director of the opera cannot read the score, but I can listen mm. very well. Mm. I really listen well. Do you, do you ever, when you're directing an opera, do you bring a camera with you to work no. at all? No. Never. It's such different worlds. Uh, uh, cinema and opera bite each other like cat and dog. <laughs> and, and no one, even the competent filmmakers, including Ingmar Bergman, never really succeeded to transform opera into a movie. Mm. It, just doesn't, it just doesn't function for very fundamental uh, reasons uh, which we should not uh, go into, but uh, take my word. Yeah, we whoever probably is, would want to hear that. Who, who, yeah. Whoever is going to try will fail, mm. because the, the, the fundamental incompatibilities are so high that it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, opera should remain opera, and let movie remain movie. Verna, you're, in America, your first films arrived um, more or less, I believe, at the same time as, as other films. And forgive me for saying from Germany yeah. and not saying from Bavaria, but um, uh, you know, and I think there was a sense that you know, the great exciting thing that had happened in world cinema was the, the new German films and, and this remarkable, what appeared to be synchronicity of suddenly here are films by Werner Herzog and the Fassbinder films and, and Wim Wenders and Von Trotta yeah. and all this, the, the best films seem now suddenly to be coming from Germany. So there was, a, a, I think there was probably some branding that you were, you were probably branded by being part of the new German cinema or something yeah. like that. Did you feel in any way any kind of affinity, even though there was no stylistic similarities with these other directors? And, and did you feel that, 
that that uh, it was that you didn't like being being labeled as part of a movement. Well, I, I was labeled, and you can't do anything against it. So I, I let it I let it pass as it was. But what was significant and what I understood is there was a real renaissance of, of German cinema. And we were not accepted immediately. It took many years until because um, there was um, a very understandable reluctance to accept German culture again. Hmm. Germany has lapsed, had lapsed into the utmost, deepest abyss of barbarism in the Third Reich during the Nazi time. And all of a sudden, a new generation that grew up after the Nazi regime. We were old enough in the late 60s, mid 60s, late 60s to articulate ourselves. And a man like Fritz Lang um, uh, could not believe that ever German cinema would emerge again. Lotte Eisner sent him a letter and he, she said, I saw Signs of Life, that was the first film that was shown here in New York, mm. for example. Mm. He, she said to him, there's, there's, a, there's a film you must see, it's called Signs of Life by a young man. And Fritz Lang wrote back, Lotte, it is not possible that there will be ever any decent movies out of Germany. Mm. And, um, and that was somehow the, 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 the mood of, of the time. And it was more a, a question of perseverance, of continuing making films and, and, and uh, bringing them to audiences. And, and within um, uh, seven, eight, ten years, um, the audiences here in America and in other countries started to, to accept us. Mm. Did, during that period of time where you were sort of branded and faced with the same kind of hurdle to overcome, did, did you become well acquainted with, with Fassbinder and vendors and people like that? or Not very well acquainted, but uh, Fassbinder uh, liked me a lot and I liked him. And for example, when I went out to pre-production of Aguirre, The Wrath of God, I said to myself, I'm not going to go to a country like Peru and I'm not going to show up with empty hands. I brought eight films with me, mm -hmm. some of my own stuff three films by Fassbinder. Mm. He didn't even know that. I grabbed some of his prints mm. uh, and, and, and showed it, showed wow. it to students in, in Peru and, and he learned about it. And when he met me a year later or so, he, he just, we didn't know how to deal with each other. Mm -hmm. There was always a, 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 a menacing group of uh, leather-clad uh, consorts of his <laughs> who, were, who were suspicious about me because Fassbinder would grab me and hug me. And, and we had this kind of strange fleeting hugs. <laughs> and, but but we, we, kind, we, we really liked each other and we really respected each other as different as we were in lifestyle, in uh, movie making, in, in everything. Um, Wenders, yes, I, I always liked his films. Not all of them, but most of them, same thing with Fassbinder. Sometimes I lost confidence and I thought, three films sloppily made in a row. And all of a sudden he comes with a, with a sensational movie. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's just staggering. And it took him three months to make three, four movies. Mm. Yeah. Um, Schlöndorf has been a great defender of 